Hello and welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann, and I would like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. There are a lot of options out there, and the fact that you're right here with me, I truly appreciate. You inspire me to find new guests, read new books, and create new stories to share with you. So thank you for all of it. Please don't mind if I don't sound my 100% normal self. It was a little stuffy in the hotel over the weekend in New Jersey for Exotica, and I always feel like I get a little bit of hotel dust allergy, like I've gotten weak. I used to travel on the road and stay in many subpar hotels, and uh, I remember this feeling when you get back from the road, but I feel great, just a little stuffiness that I'm working through, so hopefully it isn't too much of a distraction for you as I get through catching you up on everything. Yes, I have a guest, another author. I am on a tear with authors. I actually have another book that I'm halfway through uh, doing a cover to cover read for another interview that I'm going to share with you. And I'm super excited about it. And the excuse to be like, hey, I can't do anything because I've got to sit still and cuddle up with a book. Uh, it's, a, it's a work project. It really is awesome because I love to read and I love having this mission of a deadline of like, you're interviewing tomorrow, must finish book by tomorrow. And that I will do. As an author myself of two books, it's so nice to do an interview when somebody pulls something from your book that you know they actually read it, as opposed to somebody that just read the press sheet that was sent out or maybe the little bit on the back of the of the book. Uh, but I like to really get into it and show that respect to the authors that are giving me their time to sit here for us so we get to have a cool conversation. I mentioned the hotel at Exotica and the little stuffiness I have going on. But it's time to get into the deep down of the actual event itself. So this was, I think, the 15th anniversary of Exotica, New Jersey, which is in Edison. And it's their biggest show. The Northeast just has a great amount of people that come out for this show. And because I grew up in the Northeast and I have people that knew me back when I was Sunshine at Al's Diamond Cabaret, I get to have the most incredible reunion at these shows. And I, I see people, it's a great time for friends to come in and see me that can't get, we don't get a chance to meet up elsewhere. Shout out to Scott who came in and instead of ordering his calendar from my store, shoplisaand.com, Scott came in and got his calendar in person. So shout out to Scott for coming in. Wendy came and saw me uh, in Chicago. Kevin with an A came to see me in New Jersey. These are all people I now play fantasy football with. And some of them I met through fantasy football. So going to these shows is just a great reunion. And it's also a great reminder of how hard everybody works in the industry. You see the line for Angela White and you know, Angela White is not getting a break today. She's not going to get to go to the bathroom. She's not going to do anything. And there's so many fans that are waiting for hours to see her. And it's just magical to see everyone smiling, enjoying themselves and just letting their thoughts just be free for a weekend of Exotica is something else. It's an escape. That's what these shows really are. And that's what these events are, is people come, whether it's guys coming or women coming together or couples coming or whoever's coming, they're, they're just escaping from their pattern of the routine. And they're out, whether they're meeting their favorite stars, whether they're shopping. There's a lot of shopping at these shows now. It is just a great little last thing we could do in the Northeast before we are too concerned to make major plans because of weather. And that's something I talked with a lot of people about at the show was like, yeah, the timing is great. And I mean, early November in the Northeast, this could be our last big event that we get out for if we get snowed in, as they say we might get this winter, which I'm hoping for, of course. But I got to see all of my favorite people. I signed at both booths. I signed at Sapphire. I signed, I signed for the Real Loyal Fans booth. And then the first night, I went back into the city to appear at Sapphire 60 for a wine tasting, which was a lot of fun. They put out this beautiful spread with all kinds of snacks and cheese and meats for everyone that came over and grapes. It was really beautiful. Sapphire went incredibly out of their way to make that night special for me. And then on Saturday, I signed again all day, both 
uh, Sapphire booth, both loyal fans booth. And then I hosted the hotel party. And when I hosted the hotel party, I was told that I was going to be asked to go up and intro the band. And I, and they said, just stay where you are and we'll come get you. And I heard my name being called, but I was like, you know, they told me they would come get me. And I was worried that if I got up and went into the crowd into a different direction to go over, somebody would come to get me. Well, what we realized was there was a little miscommunication. So I ended up going up to reintroduce the band, like kind of halfway through their show, um, which was funny. And they were very excited. A uh, band is called Radio Stranger. And I used the intro, I'm no stranger to the radio as I talk on the radio. And, but you are now listening to Radio Stranger. That was like my hitch. As soon as they told me five minutes before I was doing this, um, first they said, hey, at 12.45 a.m., you're going to be getting on stage. And I said, oh, is this my opportunity to tell a bunch of dad jokes? And they're like, no, you're introducing the band, but if you'd like to tell one dad joke, you can. So I did. I told my favorite dad joke. It's a very simple one. I'll share it with you here. When does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes apparent. I just love that joke. And of course the drummer gave me a but um bump and I kind of got a little boo, which made it even more fun. Uh, and then Sunday back at the show, I signed for both booths. I did loyal fans first. Then I went and did my book reading. And then I went to the Sapphire booth before I came back into the city. And on my drive into the city with Justin, we timed it so we could listen to the Cowboys game, which it was devastating because we were a very close game until we just pulled up at my apartment when we lose. And I was like, okay, well, now I won't be focused on that. I will focus on unpacking. But each time I go to Exotica, I do a book reading. And for the past year, I've always been reading out of The Life Back, my latest book. But this time I thought it would be fun to kind of go back into the life and revisit the Palin chapter because I've recently been re-listening to the Eminem song, We Made You. And I'll listen to it like when I first get to the gym, just to remember how awesome that day was to be in an Eminem video as Sarah Palin. And so I was reading from that chapter and just flashing back and having all of these memories. And I do a really cool Q&A afterwards, which always starts out very slow. Like one person has a question and then nobody and then nobody. And then everybody has a question. So I, I know I got to like break the seal, get a couple people comfortable. They see how I answer. And then more people start raising their hands. And it's a great time for me to find out what people are truly curious about um, and what intrigues them about the industry. And one of the questions was about AI. And do I support, you know, AI content, which is becoming a big conversation. And it's one of the reasons that the SAG uh, strike is still happening, the Screen Actors Guild, because of AI. So what AI wants to be able to do, what companies want to be able to do with AI is once they put you in a product once, then they own your likeness, voice, and look to be able to create as many AI videos as they want. And I'm so pro AI in so many things. First, my first 100% I'm so pro for this is AI in the medical space. Because think about the fact that before COVID, the number two cause of death in the US was medical, it was misdiagnosis, it was complications from misdiagnosis, it was a lack of proper screening. So what this AI in medical can do is make a very educated decision by gathering more data in a shorter period of time with no bias of a person that just saw something similar that assumed it was that something similar, that person being a doctor, a person, a doctor being too busy going room to room, not being able to take the time to look through maybe years of medical records. Cause as we get older, there's years of medical records and so AI in the medical space is going to be able to take all of the, the studies that have been done and is going to be able to formulate things that I think AI could really help us crack the code with discovering the link causes or the link similarities in certain you know, migrations of diseases and cancers and, and finding cures and treatments faster because think about all of the studies that have already been done and being able to funnel that information together. So I'm pro AI in the medical space in the biggest way. 
I might even be pro AI in the education space because I'm sure one day they're going to consider AI teachers, but I'm also pro AI when it comes to text. So it's so great to use chat GPT to write captions, to give descriptions of things for my podcast, for the title, for the description, for social media posts. AI can be so incredibly helpful because I can put in some cues, some keywords, and I will get descriptions that are better than I could have ever dreamed of with so much accurate detail. But when it comes to AI in the space of what this, this question was asked to me about content, it's that I would be concerned about the industry not being able to keep as many people working right? Because you, if talent only needs to show up once and then these companies are going to own their likeness, then they're not going to need to hire them again. And I also think it was it's very important to think about the difference when you're watching a real scene where you can see the skin texture changing and the, and the, and the skin getting perspiration and the skin tone changing. You could see veins and you could see things that are very real. You can feel, hear, and watch breathing. We're never going to be able to mimic that when it comes to something uh, in that space. And so I think that's where it becomes very different, but I thought that was an interesting question. It was a great Q&A, and it was a great time for me to remember how fun it was that time span in my life playing Palin. And that's also the great thing that I'm doing right now. Like I go to Australia this weekend where I'll be appearing at Sexpo Love X, which is like an exotica, but it's a little bit different for me. When I travel internationally, I don't take my own merch. They'll make photos for me to sign and I just sign for everybody and take photos. So it's a little bit less work for me. Uh, you don't have to be shipping everything and ordering everything and making sure it lands at the right time and that it's going to get, that's so much easier. But what I love is just kind of stepping back and remembering all of the things that I've done in my life and all of the great relationships I've formed from all of the things that I've done in my life. And so I feel myself now having a greater sense of gratitude for the good things in the industry. Sure, when I left, there were things that I left over that we forget the bad, which is the best part of human nature. And I can remember the good and be so present and connect with this new generation of performer and cam model and, and companies. I've, I'm learning these shows now have companies. There's now great scan companies that are going to help the talent protect their likeness. So I got to sit and talk with them. Like I'm getting to see how technology is evolving in the industry and kind of stay there with my finger on the pulse of it. But more than anything, being present reminds me of all the fun I had doing these shows for years. And it just centers me back to still holding on to that bit of joy and that fun that I feel when I get to see Christy Canyon and Ginger Lynn and Lainey and all of my people that I that I speak with regularly. And then some of the girls that I only get to see at these shows like Kiki. Luckily, I do get to see Kiki once in a while when Kiki comes into New York, but just reconnecting and just having that you know, moment where we get to chat, how have things been? What bookings have you enjoyed? What clubs did you love the most on these bookings? You know, all of the things that we're doing and being able to share content, information, and contacts as well. So I can always say, oh, I have this club that I think you'd really like. Let me do a link for you right here. And so I had a great time. It was a really fun exotica. It flew by as it always does, those long days and then hosting an event at night where normally I do sneak in a little 40 minute nap between my day work and my night work. But by the time I got home last night, there was no way I could even watch the Sunday night game. I was like, I'll just watch it tomorrow, get a good night's sleep, get ready to rally because you're going to get ready to do it all over again. And so just cool to be able to go. And I thank everybody that supports the industry and goes to these shows and has a good time and just watching how hard everybody works to put something so special together. And before I forget, I'll say this. Real Loyal Fans is the now big sponsor booth. For years, it was Bad Dragon. Before that, it was Club Magazine. It was like the original. It was called Club Spotlight Booth. And Real Loyal Fans is run by just some of the greatest people. And so they have a center to the booth that is like our break area. And in that center of the booth, they have a cooler with bottles of water for us. They have a variety of healthy snacks, like a, like 20 bowls of healthy snacks. They have a spa that comes in on Saturday and offers us free foot massages. On Saturday, on Sunday, they bring in a, a huge spread of food. 
Like they really have gone out of their way. So I got to say, building this relationship with this new company that is just providing so much greatness for not just me, but everybody that signs there and everybody that works for Real Loyal Fans. And so I have to give them a shout out for making us all feel so special. Last year, I did not take advantage of the foot massage, but you know what? This year I did. I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. And it was magical. I did it kind of a little bit before I was getting ready to leave so that I could go and lay down and take a 45 minute nap. But it was just so kind of them. And it's such a neat thing that they do. And it really reminds me of the 90s because that was when I got into the business and every booth did that because they wanted every girl to be so happy signing at the booth and not want to leave. They didn't want you to be hungry and have to go somewhere and get food. They really catered to us. It's kind of really coming back with real loyal fans. So shout out to them. Shout out to their company for being so great to us. And also a big thanks to Jay and Dan, Brittany, the entire team at Exotica, who makes sure that we're all safe, who makes sure that we have everything we need and puts on a great show for not just us, but for our fans to enjoy. So on the same frame of staying in the moment of Lisa Ann and all things Lisa Ann, Exotica, my history in the industry, today's guest ties in with that perfectly. Vic Legina and I have been friends since we met. Now, it doesn't help that yesterday was the big day where his Philadelphia Eagles matched up against my Dallas Cowboys. And of course, Cowboys lose. And Vic is very happy and Vic sends the text and Vic does it all. He does the most. And I'm like, Vic, you know what? I did not expect us to win. I'm unpacking from Exotica. I can't do this right now. And he's giving me all the moments by text. I loved the fact that when I first met Vic and walked into his house where he was producing movies at that time for Brazzers, producing, directing, shooting camera, he's done it all. But in his office, he had this huge Eagles banner. And I was like, boom, I have a common ground with this cat. We're going to talk football. I always wanted to find something on set that would keep me in my world of normalcy while I was leaning into that world of fantasy. Because you do have to lean into the world of fantasy once you step into that set. But it is so great to be able to be offset and have some balanced, normal, fun conversation, which is always what I had with Vic. And also, there was a second part to my adoration for Vic when we first met. Vic's a dog lover. He's always had dogs. He loves his dogs. He takes great care of his dogs. And as soon as he started shooting outside of his house and we were going into a studio, I always requested to shoot with Vic because I knew once we got into a studio, he would make sure that we were out every day by five because he needed to go home and walk his dogs. And so the common ground of being a NFL fan, I don't love that he's an Eagles fan, but whatever. And then knowing that once he started shooting in a studio and not at his house, we were going to be out by five. As a businesswoman, you analyze aspects of the people that you're going to do business with. And there were other producers, directors, camera crews that worked with Brazzers that would lollygag on set and literally keep you there till midnight. And to me, we got the same product done. We did the same thing. Why am I here from eight in the morning till midnight? Well, why would I do that? I'm just going to go and work with Vic. And so I would request him and I would tell browsers like, yeah, I'll shoot for you, but I will only shoot for Vic Legina. Um, so if you want to shoot. So it, it, all my last scenes through them and for many years we worked together, we have a great friendship. We have a great relationship. And when I knew he was starting this process of writing this book right here, Filthy, and we got to talk through the entire process. We talked through the massive amount of work that he put into his audiobook with different voices. I mean, the audiobook is going to be an escape like a movie. It's like 12 hours. So it's going to be a couple days for you to get through it. You're going to love it. But he put so much passion into this. And the fact that the skill set that he gathered from being a producer in the industry, managing content, shooting camera, editing, sound, he used all of that when he put together his new future project, which is right here, his book. Today, I bring you my friend, Vic Legina. I seem to be on a bit of a roll with authors right here as my guest, which I love because you all know I love to read. But I'm going to tell you, this is a book that everyone in my world would love to write, but no one has the balls of my friend, 
Vic Legina <laughs> to do it. And the yeah. book I'm talking about right here is out. It is called Filthy, and it is the untold story that you've always wanted. There we are, Vic. I'm mm-hmm. so glad to see you here today. And so glad to see you as well. It's been uh, it's been what a couple of weeks since I last saw you. A couple of weeks, and it was yeah. really an important weekend. You were in New York City for your 50th birthday. While we were at your dinner at Say Less, the books became available on Amazon. Everybody at the table ordered copies immediately. You were staying here and unwrapped your first touch of your own book. A lot has happened between then and now. How are you feeling about the response that you're getting? Uh, people are loving it, actually. I was, I was worried. You know, anytime you reveal something to the world and a piece of you. In this case, my soul, my my flesh, my blood, my sweat, my tears, my pain, all of it. You're I'm I'm giving this to the world to dissect, to judge, to consume, and it is a little little weird and it is a little scary, but so far those who are liking it are really loving it. Because at the end of the day, when I decided to do this, I didn't want to write a book. I wanted to write a good book or a great book. Otherwise, no reason to bother, you know, go big or, or go home. And that's really what I did here. And filthy is based on your life as one of the most well-known producers, directors, creators who worked for the whole mind geek man, win all the names companies. But you know, when you talk to performers in the industry, you know, Vic Lagina always comes up as being one of the favorites. You were a favorite of mine to be on your sets because of how you ran your sets, but you also saw things as a performer, you see so much, but if I'm only on set five days a month, I'm only seeing a fifth of what you're seeing on set 20 days a month while producing big events, live shows. So you really got into the day-to-day life of being you and operating for so long in this business. Yeah, yeah. No, I did a number count. Uh, th- almost 3,800 scenes produced and or directed over, I'd say, an 18-year period. I mean, I'd say my official exit was 20 years. But working for the entity of Mansef and Manwin and MindGeek, that was 16-plus uh, years of my life. And we did quite a bit. Prolific is the word for what we did. And it's it's amazing to me, I think, what I find interesting is how much I've forgotten, you know, out of all of that, like you hold up an envelope of two, two, five, seven releases. You're like, I don't even remember this day. Like what happened there? And the fact that someone had sex in for money on camera in front of me and I forgot them. I feel so bad. I feel so bad about it, but, but that means the day went well and nothing went sideways because I only remember the shit shows. I don't know. I don't know why my my brain thinks that way, but the days that went sideways are the ones where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to have to jot something down about this one because at the end of it all, um, those are the ones that left an impression. Let's just say that. Yeah, because it is like work. So you forgetting a scene or however many scenes that went as planned, it's just like anybody else's normal work day. You know, when you, whatever it is you're doing, if everything goes smooth, it's, you know, you just go through your thing, then your day is over, boom. But it's when you're traveling to a work event and your flight is delayed nine hours or something crazy happens that you remember. But what other people remember about their trips not going well is I got to the hotel. They didn't have my reservation for you. The litany of things Mm -hmm. that you've watched go wrong Mm-hmm. is much different than others. So without being too graphic for YouTube, can you share some of the short stories without naming people to give up anything that people are going to want to read themselves because Filthy does name names? Yeah. Memorable yeah. moments. Well, the ones that stuck out were those live shows, uh, for sure. Especially, you know, when I was putting together this book, you know, you, you have to set it up as a prologue, as an epilogue. And I set up the epilogue within the prologue, but that prologue was when I hosted a live orgy right over there in, in my pool for the internet, live on the internet. We're talking, uh, what was it? Five women and three guys. And then we get through it and I'm thinking I'm going to have a raid soon because it's really loud. Like, when when girls are screaming about 
I mean, what I, I get it. Work? I get it. What, YouTube friendly. I YouTube friendly. I get it. <laughs> okay. Well, they're we can't up, get uh, this video deleted, Vic. This is going to be a podcast okay. as well. We can't get it deleted from YouTube. Okay. This is going to be a challenge for me, but I'm going to do my best. So yeah, when they're screaming um, uh, four letter words really loud and I'm just like, okay, we have to finish this one up because I just feel something bad is about to happen. And we wrap, everything's done. We cut the feed and everything's good. And then 10, 10 minutes later, uh, hello, can someone please talk to us? It's the police. And I'm like, eh, okay, everyone be cool. You know, we're done. We're done now. Just stay out of sight. And I go out there and then uh, they tell me that my neighbor called the cops because of excessive profanity in my backyard. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I had a party. It got a little out of control. But now, By the way, this party was probably like on a Tuesday afternoon because that's when you were shooting this thing, right? Yeah, yeah, because I was worried that like, you know, kids are getting out of school. Yep, got to hammer it out quick. Yeah, yeah. And buses could be coming by. So it was like we have we this, this window of like late afternoon, early evening before the sun sets. And that's when we have to get this done. And we did. I will always say I got the job done, always. And that's why I think they appreciated me up in Montreal in, until they didn't appreciate me anymore, which was towards the end. And when you share these stories with everybody that only sees the finished product, they see the best photos, they see the edited, curated video, the storyline, they don't know the difficulties of maybe getting a setup shot somewhere specific, which is going to be tough to shoot, or even sound issues that kind of make things difficult. This really is a tell-all of even the failures of talent and crews, mm -hmm. which I think fans will mm -hmm. find very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think towards the end, I was, I was feeling the trickle down of the nonsense coming from the top, from the head office. And then I go into my crew, which, you know, my crew, I felt like, you know, that should be the one aspect I had control of. But after a certain point, everyone just had a reason to complain about something. And I'm like, people, you have money coming in your pocket. Can you yeah. just shut up and <laughs> just do the job? But, you know, you, you got a lot of complaining. But then you got the talent. And, and I'm not going to say all the talent were screwed up because they weren't. You had some really professional people. You were always professional. People showed up happy to be there, ready to go. And then you had those who didn't. And mm -hmm. you're like... And you know, like, here's the thing. I'm an intense individual and I'm a pre prepared individual. And, and this is I'm why we get along so well. Yes. And I don't expect anyone to match my level because that would be insane. Like, because I am a hyper-focused, hyper, very dedicated person. But all I'm asking for all the talent out there was like, just meet me halfway and I will carry you. I will show you to that finish line. And I always did. And it worked for so long. Uh, and until it wasn't anymore, or <laughs> until until the rule the rules of the business no Changed. longer made sense. Yeah, yeah. Never, they just didn't make sense to me at the end, and that was the reason why I was like, I'm done. I think it's really hard to be a lifer in this business in every way, shape, or form. I've been lucky to be able to carry on to events and things that are like the next layer of it, but it did get to a point where the chaos became monotonous. And it's such a weird thing to say, but the expectation, I mean, you brought up the cops. I can remember when I had my agency, I had a shoot, five people on the shoot, the shoot got raided. I get a call from a makeup artist that when the cops came in and asked for everybody's ID, every single person I booked had a warrant. Mm. So every one of them got <laughs> taken to the police station. Not one of mine returned. I was like, what do I do now? Like this was mm. a whole... And, and that's, that's like a level of a distractor from handling the things as a creator, as the director, producer, you had to be up incredibly early cause you're on West coast and you're dealing with Montreal and you're making sure you have everything for that day. A lot of times before a lot of talent moved to Vegas, you were shooting in Vegas, always steadfast to shooting in Vegas. We would fly from LA. So you had to rely on people getting flights, not getting stuck in traffic. So the level of intensity for you. On the average day, what time did it start where you were like, it's this intense till I go um, to bed? Well, I mean, I would always wake up around four always and then just work out, work out. And if I had a message on my phone, that's when I was like, okay, time to get ahead of it because we already have the set built. We have everything ready. So usually I would start hammering my production manager being like, okay, we've got a problem. 
And I always used to tell talent, if there's any problem, let us know the night before. That way we can work on the night before, not at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. So, so really at the end of it all, I was just like, okay, well, uh, we're going to have to just be up early just to make sure the job gets done. And that's really what it, what it was. It was, it was preparing for the failures and the chaos that you actually were mentioning. Um, I actually could embrace that chaos and lean into it and I could be able to, uh, anticipate problems. And they, they made sense to me. The problems I knew that I could foresee made sense. The problem was when nothing made sense anymore like logic and reason and accountability and all of these things were completely out the window. And I was like, I think this is too slippery of a slope to operate on. And I think it's time for me to say, I've done enough. I've made enough. I think mental health is more important than money. And I think it's time that I say goodbye with dignity. And then that's when it was like, okay, let's, let's walk away uh, at least on our, our, on our, our terms rather than anything else. And the memories that you have that you took an intense amount of time, you and I are close friends. So I've been talking to you through the journey of you writing this book. I was talking to you through the journey of you doing the audiobook, which we'll get to in a bit. But how much did you go through? Because you still have, like, like you said, all the 2257 records, but you mm-hmm. still have hard drive after hard drive after hard drive of content. Did you go back into any of that content to jog your memory of specific days and watch any of the like behind the scenes? Cause you always oh, yeah. had BTS. Okay. What was yep. that experience like for you on the outside looking in at your previous existence? It was, um, it was like a time warp. Like I was getting th- thrusted right back into that moment. And I was like, I know exactly what I was thinking at that moment because I know exactly where, where my head was, what my reaction was and everything, everything was going on. Like I knew what was happening by, by seeing it, but it was really, I guess the biggest thing was not so much that I, I participated in these things. It's the fact of how quickly I forgot, like, like the, the acts that Diana Prince did in my pool and I forgot she did them. Like, how does one forget something like that? And when I, when I looked at the footage, I was like, Oh yeah, it was her. Okay. (laughs) And then I set up in the epilogue, which was when we unsuccessfully looked for the next Brazzers male talent. And oh my, like it was, it was, that was the, the most ridiculous thing I ever directed in my life because I'm thinking why on earth would these young men sign up for something like this and then be okay with it being broadcast to the internet? Because I'll tell you, uh, many of them crashed into the mountain like right away. And of I'm, course they and, did. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, yeah. Okay, but every yeah. guy thinks they can do it, Vic. Every guy thinks they can do it. They say it to me all the time. And I say to them all the time, I would ruin your sexual future. You would fail miserably and never be able to look yourself in the eyes in the mirror again. That's the reality of it. Okay. Once yeah. the, once the room is quiet and you can't have any sound because you need perfectly, you can hear their heart beating. That's what I'm like. Oh, this is done. I'll be pushing rope up a hill today. It's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell everyone, I was like, you know, my book is great for people who think they want to enter porn. Like here's the manual, right? Like here, read this first and then decide, Oh, okay. I want to get into porn or not get into porn because this may, um, Make you rethink some things. Well, you had said that when you went back through footage, uh, that it really thrust you back into it. So here I am at mm-hmm. night, you know, getting my chapters in reading. Lainey is already through your book cover to cover. I knew she would be. That's why I ordered her one immediately. But I will say this. It is mildly triggering for me because a lot of what you write about are the same things that affected me since you and I are so alike. You had said, you know, we're prepared, you know, we're serious about it. We're focused when we want to, we want to create, we want to produce, we want to finish the project, the dilly dallying, the insane things, guys just coming to set wasted. And while I'm doing pretty girls passing out, you have a story in your book about a guy. We won't mention it because the reader's (laughs) going to find it. I won't mention mine, but it's not that uncommon now. Okay. What are we going to do? Well, I don't get paid if this guy can't perform, obviously can't. Okay. We can get somebody else. Okay. It's going to be five hours. Okay, great. I'm going to sit in this place for five hours, still be in the mood that I, cause I got to protect my paycheck mm-hmm. and those variables of insecurity to anyone who 
understands business on a on a bigger level is like this is unrealistic. I can't plot and plan on this. This is this is too so when I read this, I'm reminded because right now, you know, Vic, I'm just holding on to all the the the, the fringe activities, exoticas, going to Australia next week for a trip, you know, to Sexpo. Like I get to do all the goods. This, these experiences that I got to see firsthand, being in a makeup chair in a room with a girl in the same room who opens a bathroom drawer at eight o'clock in the morning and pulls out a bottle of Bacardi and just is drinking it in the makeup chair. I, I remember many times on set looking over at a situation like that saying, these are not your people, Lisa. These are not your people. But I now have to feel comfortable performing an act with this woman who I Mm -hmm. now am wondering for the next two hours while I'm in the makeup chair of all the decisions she's made since her last test and how those decisions could affect my health for the rest of my life. That really started to burden me as a performer. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we all had our things. You had your things that were different that, that made you feel like this wasn't the business for you anymore. I had mine. Uh, realization, I think the biggest thing that I figured out was um, the disconnect I had with understanding the new breed of sex worker coming through the business. It was kind of like that disconnect that a father would have with their daughter where they just don't understand each other. And that's what I was feeling. And I was like, and I'm asking them to have sex consensually on camera. Hmm. Is this a good idea? And the other voice said, no, I think it's not a good idea. I think it's time we find something else to do with our lives or we do something uh, or, or, or we just try to get in, into their corner now and maybe shoot their OnlyFans, which, by the way, was no cakewalk either. <laughs> and it wasn't always fun either. So I, I just felt like there was a certain point. It's like, like, dude. You're done. Like you were on Mount High. You were as high as okay. you can be. Okay. Who life. was telling you when you started to dabble in this OnlyFans thing that this was a bad idea.com and that you were going to hate this decision? It was me. Uh, you, you, you were, you were. And then the voice in my head. Uh, because uh, because it's, uh, it's a reliability thing. How motivated are is someone? Like it's just too easy to cancel. They won't cancel on the big company. Okay. But they will cancel on their own self. They will work for someone else and be a worker before they will focus on being, which makes no sense, okay, at all, because you could repurpose the content for the rest of your being, as I am, you know? Right. But as you touched in with the writing, and then Mm -hmm. you go back and you start making passes through editing, you relived all of these experiences multiple times. Was there a point when you were reliving one where like a random detail that hadn't come to you yet just popped into your mind? You're like, oh my gosh, yep. how could I forget about this side story? Yep. Yep. And and that happened quite a bit. And that's why I was actually really grateful that the editing process took about a year because all of, because like, as I said, I'm pretty hyper, hyper focused and hyper obsessive. And then I was like, oh, I can't believe I forgot that. I could put it in right here. And I did all that. And I was able to craft this story that really wrapped up when it was ready to wrap up. Like my story wasn't really wrapped up when I was writing this. Like I started writing this thing in early 2015. I mean, that's eight and a half years ago plus. And when I wrote it and I started reading all of it and I was like, wow, uh, maybe you need to start turning some corners in life, bro. Like you're, you're going kind of, kind of hard in the paint. And this is not going to end well. So why don't you just kind of start hitting the gas a little and maybe not doing cocaine so much? Or how about how about make some rules like only do cocaine if it's off of like a boob or a butt of a porn star? And I'm like, that's fair. That's totally fair. But then like and then I would add to it. And then the truth was COVID hit. So far left. Yeah. Like 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 the uh, the, the, like COVID hit. And that's really when my story started wrapping up. And I was like, you know what? The story of Vic Legina is ending. So now's a good time to finish up whatever this is, whether it starts as a journal and ends up being a book, which is what it was. But as that was happening, the story of Mind Geek was ending too, simultaneously. So all this stuff was happening. And during that time, your parent company at that time was also... Uh, in in hot water yes. over illegal content, they had to remove yeah. over fifty percent of the hub yeah. over the fact that these were scenes that were not they were they were revenge poor they were horrible horrible yeah. things, 
Yeah. And at that point, I knew you didn't feel good about being aligned with that. It was all coming to an end, but like that was a pinnacle point where it's like, how can you be in bed with these people? Like right. we, we, we just doesn't align with who we are as human beings. Look, we, we might talk, you might talk some crazy ass shit in your book. You might talk about all those phases you went through, but at the end of the day, we're still good human beings who want to be sure that what we're doing is not aligned with a company that hurt other people. Right. Right. And it was really interesting that like when our relationship severed, their house really started to burn like a month after. And I felt really good. Like, like we were pretty much done, I'd say about August of 2020, but it wasn't formalized until a few months later. And then December, all the stuff about Pornhub and everything else. And then, and then like the whole house was burning and I was like, wow. You got out. I, yeah. Like I, I couldn't feel bad about that decision. And for those who are still part of it, okay, look, I get it. You got to, you got to make a living and you got to justify yeah. But, but I'm glad I didn't have to make those conversations with myself anymore to justify. Like I stayed in this business a long time, longer than I wanted to because the money was so good. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, dude, you're probably not going to make as much, uh, as, as much as this annoys you and bugs you, you're not going to make this much money probably. So just keep collecting, keep your soul in check. Don't like go off the rails too, but too much. I mean, I did somewhat, but, but I'm, I'm back. The, the train is, is nice, is on the tracks again. And we're good. You know what's ironic about reading your book? Can I tell you something? Sure. sure. All the years we've been friends. Okay. I never yeah. knew how far off the rails you went. As a matter <laughs> of fact, I never knew about your habits. So mm -hmm. obviously you didn't do things like directly in front of me. Cause you knew it was something I didn't do. And also I'm overall a pretty lame human being when it comes to mm -hmm. partying. I was out till over after five o'clock in the morning on Saturday, my friends <gasps> every hour the hour like oh my god mm. is something wrong here she's out but yeah. reading this i didn't know that you were in that space uh for such a period of time do you think yeah. you were doing that just to mask that you were unhappy with what you were doing there was a lot of reasons for it and i've done a lot of like introspective self analysis analysis on all this stuff because you know i had i had a couple really really bad relationships and i got out of one that left some, some permanent scars. And I felt, I felt a lot of the guilt from that because my family was dragged through a lot of things that they shouldn't have had to like, like my stuff should not have affected them. And it did. But the other thing I realized, and when I was writing all the in memoriams of all the, the fallen soldiers of porn and you read their stories and you read and you understand how much pain they were in, I was feeling all of their pain as well as mine. So I was doing quite a bit of self-medicating not only just to mask the pain and not feel it, but also because we had so much work that it was like, let's just turn the page and get to the next, let's get to the next. And it was a vicious cycle. I'd say from 2012 to 2014 was when I was at my heaviest of, of my, my abuse. But, you know- And that was a tough time, let me interrupt. Uh, 2013 yeah. was when we had the most shutdowns in the industry, in yeah. the industry's history in one year. That yeah. was a very tough time. And that was when we were really making the break to the next mm. round of what was going to be changing in the industry. To me, 2013 was what made me decide I was retiring December of right. 2014. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a lot of those changes going on. Um, but you know, we were still at that point in second ownership, third ownership and hadn't, hadn't taken over. Um, second ownership, I would liken to the rich dudes at the strip club that were making it rain and throwing money. And even though we couldn't stand the person who was throwing the money, we were all grabbing for it because we were in a bad economy, you know, a recession. Boy, that I was when I flew to Montreal and got Johnny Sins his first contract. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, listen, they were, they had the cash flow, like the, the, yeah, I, I knew it. And I told Johnny what I was going to get him. He's like, uh, no, there's no way. I'm like, watch me come back and tell you how much money you're making a month. I was yeah. not a happier moment. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, and, but, but that was the reality. They were, they were throwing money at everything. They had and the so, money. So, right. so, so you had to play ball. You had and to play ball. You had to play ball. And like, you know, I was always, I am a team player. Yeah. And I'm always going to do good by the company and all that stuff. But the same man, I'm like, okay. But it wasn't until third ownership took over that I really knew what kind of people were starting to run. You don't know how bad it is, but you kind of know that they are greedy and they are wanting to make as much money. And they put very little value on the people who are putting that money in their pocket. You basically are replaceable. And that's how they looked at it. 
Yep. But I also looked at it. There was still money to be made in this game, yeah. especially with them, by feeding them their slop. You know, here you go. I will continue banging out great yep. porn that you're going to make money on. And in turn, you're going to keep me employed. And I always knew I was only as good as my last shoot with them. Always. Because Same. If, thing, if, if things go bad, oh, okay, well, we're not yep. going to deal with you anymore. There was no guarantee. that They have contracts, but those contracts weren't contracts. They just No, were. they're contracts that benefit them. They don't really benefit exactly. you or us. Yeah. But right. it, it's a time. Like, And I think uh, there, are, there are some people that can stay – unattached from all of that emotion, but I understand the feeling of absorbing everybody else's sadness because it's mm -hmm. even sad to be sitting in a makeup chair, the story I shared with you a moment or two ago, and see a girl at 8 a.m. drinking warm Bacardi. That breaks yeah. my heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. Seeing all the girls coming in that had cut marks up their arms. I didn't even yep. know what that was. I yep. didn't even learn about cutting. I learned about cutting through so many of the women in the industry. And I was like, and I, I remember just thinking like all the things Every time I'm doing something, like if I'm going to go get a touch up of Botox, I think to myself, oh my gosh, this hurts so much. How can people cut themselves? Okay. Like it's yeah. my first yeah. thought. But yeah. so you are absorbing a lot of different energies and yep. because you and I are more kind of grounded and rooted and deeper people, uh, we feel that energy. It is all encompassing sometimes and hard to shake on your weekends when you get a little bit of time to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was fortunate to be in the, my bubble out here in Vegas and I was away from the industry. So I was able to decompress and, and, you know, like all I really want to do every day was just to get home to my dogs yeah. every day. It was like, as soon as I can be done, I'm going home to my dogs. Cause that was my happy place. And I think, and that was what I love the most about you when I first started working with you, because I knew I was going to be out at a reasonable time and make my flight back to LA. Cause I knew right. you wanted to walk your dogs, but you right. also put months on months into creating something that's something very unique in the audiobook mm. space. Yes. You put together an audiobook that is really almost like the movie version of mm. your book that is out and available on Amazon as well as yes. the Kindle version and it's mm. starting to land. This the audio version is starting to land certain places, mm -hmm. not yet on Spotify but the amount of time how long did it take you start to finish to do this audiobook? The audio book. Okay. So once I got done with my lawyers and the lawyers had to pour through this thing of and label everything. Cause you drop a lot of names. You I, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I felt well on that note and I'll go to the audio book in a second. When it came to this book, I didn't want to castrate it. And I think the people that I call out, I have good reason to call out because there's people that I helped in this industry that wanted to take what was mine and stab me in the back. And you know what? I'd rather people focus not on what I'm saying but looking at the behavior that they were in and what they were doing and be like, and maybe the, the light bulb will go off and they'll be like, you know, that was wrong. That was effed up. I think I could be a better person and, and learn from it. That's what I'm hoping. Most likely people's egos are going to get in the way and they're going to scream about how I insulted them. But oops, okay, I don't care. I'm moving on. I'm done with it. I don't care anymore. I give zero Fs. That's the truth. But when it comes to the audiobook, once I got done with the, the, the lawyers, which I spent a lot of my hard earned smut dollars paying them. So I listened to them. Uh, once that was locked, I, I basically recorded. I was completely sober for 40 days of recording where I would wake up sometimes at two o'clock in the morning <clears throat> before Howard was on uh, Howard Stern. And before what I would do is get my head ready and then read a, like a, a chapter or two. And then after Howard was over, I would edit it and then rinse and repeat until I was done. And I was completely sober for the straight reading. When it came time to record my alter ego, I was like, we have to break the sobriety for this one. <laughs> and what I wound up doing was the first night was more like wine and weed. Okay. So it was very, very yeah. mellow, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the second day was more alcohol and Shrimps. smidge, no, <laughs> smidge, smidge of cocaine, fentanyl free cocaine. And that was the, that was the one where I had to like really, really perform. And I got out of that closet, which was my recording studio, yeah, yeah. sweating bullets. I was <laughs> dripping with sweat because I put so much energy into it. Like I can only imagine what people do when they're recording voiceovers for like cartoons and stuff, because that's what you have to do. And then Sunday morning comes along, it's eight o'clock. And I'm like, you know, I think I got one more reading in me. Uh, let's try the acid read. Uh, boom, put it on the <laughs> tongue. And then for two and a half hours, I was in there recording and I was able to, to search which alter ego voice I wanted to put in and when. 
And that was the process. And then editing it and getting it ready. And like, this was something I did. This is what I did from start to finish. All of it, organic, no AI, none of that nonsense. This was a project that was like, this is me giving you my creativity and sharing what my experience was on this earth for all of you to, to enjoy and judge, I guess. The fact that you took some of the skill set from your previous life and things you've learned to be able to record and edit your own audiobook is huge. Uh, right. Not only did you save yourself paying somebody to do it, but you allowed yourself to do it in your own free space. You know, I enjoyed that about recording in my closet during the pandemic for my first book because mm -hmm. there was it was just whenever I felt you know you feel your voices. Right? It's much harder to be on a schedule and be like, oh, I feel into it at exactly nine o'clock when I have this studio time. But the fact yeah. that you already took something from your past and put it into your future by this editing is just an awesome reminder that every thing we do in our life carries over to in our next steps. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really happy with all of it. And, and I guess the other way I really enjoy is the fact that this is something that can earn revenue for, for the rest of my time on this earth. You know, people will still buy the book. It's always going to be out there. This is not my whole view of this whole thing was, let, we don't have to worry about hitting a home run or a triple off the bat. Let's get on base first and then let's see how far we can go. That was always my mentality. And I know what I love about this day and age with self-publishing and everything else is we can do it on our own if we're motivated and we have something good to say. And it was checking those boxes for me. Like, I think yeah, when, 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 you, when I was over there, I told you about the, the beehive. Yeah. Okay. Now tell me if I'm being too hippie ish here. But like that beehive was literally six feet from my head when I was working on this thing. Tell me those bees did not hone in on my energy. And we're like, <laughs> you know what? This is a good spot for, for a massive honey and, hive right now. And the fact that it was that massive and you'd never seen it until your dog sitter saw it at your place was like everything. I was, I was like, like, this is so big. This is so big. I was like, I was oblivious. Like, well, but you were well, focused and you were working on the audiobook. And that was really, and you go out through your garage usually, right? You don't go out through the yeah. front door. Yeah. And, and my blinds were drawn because it was like a dark tomb and I was working. I had no idea, but literally you open up the blind. You're like, it's a hive this big. <laughs> it's the size of a tire. Okay. So much, so much honey, so much honey. I was like, <laughs> and and by the way, I paid a guy to relocate it. It's in Joshua tree. Nice. He captured, he captured the queen nice. and they all follow the queen into the box. It was, it was crazy, but, but yeah, I was, I was a busy boy. Like I might be retired, but I'm not retired. You know, yeah. like, I'm not going to sit idle. Like I enjoy my life right now. Things are great. They're very chill, very mellow. So why not write a book that's going to piss off some people? Let's just, let's just throw that curveball into the mix. It's also a great conversation. I mean, Filthy is going to be one of those escape books that everyone reads. Like I'd wondered my whole life if it really was like this on set, because of course, many of us have written books, but you know, we can't tell the dark tales of our colleagues is like you could, right? Your perspective of seeing the set from that vision, from the start to finish, from missing flights to paperwork, to not having an ID, to somebody going on Twitter and saying something was awful, even though you didn't know it was awful, to all the variables involved. It's taking on a lot. Now your decompressed life is mm -hmm. everything to you. And now you're going to get to have a lot of conversations with other people about Filthy because yeah. once it gets out there, even more and more people are reading it. I know more people are going to want to ask about specific stories. Yeah. And then I just give them the QR code. Like that was the other thing. Like I would be this, I'd be holding court a lot of times at parties, whatever. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And I'm like, I should just finish this book and just, you know, make a little bit of money on the side because anything you want to know it's there. The truth is I probably have another book in me because of all those files that are in my garage and on those hard drives. Um, but let's just focus on this one right now and we'll, we'll see what we can do and how far this thing can go. Um, I mean, I'm you hit it out of the park with the artwork, uh, really unbelievable and not just on the cover, but I love mm. how everything is divided, the different fonts inside the books, mm. the way that the way your alter ego is, it's just, you're going to pick up this book, everybody. And then you're going to be like, okay, this is a fun read. And you'll probably be like Lainey and power through it. But Vic, in other news. We're yes. both football fans. Yes. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about your Eagles? I really do believe, though, that Washington kind of has their number. I mean, he, they, you got the win, but like, you know, still, yeah. it's a struggle. I think, 
I think when you're the best team in the league, everyone's going to play you very, very, very hard. That's what's going to happen. And this Sunday against your Cowboys is no different. Um, but, you know, here's the difference. I don't get crazy. Like, you saw me when they lost to the Jets. I did. Right? We were together with another Jets fan. And he was a Jets fan, an Eagles fan, and me in the center going, this is fantastic. And, and describe my temperament when we lost the game. You use the excuse, you know, we've already got one. Once you have a Super Bowl ring, it just feels different. You're not as worried about it. You kind of leaned on that. But was I angry? No, but you were like, you know, <laughs> passive aggressive about it for sure. I thought you were hiding your anger. <laughs> no, I was like, hey, okay, whatever. So tomorrow is a new day and we're going to just focus on next week. And that's, and that's, and that's really what you have to do when it comes to sports, especially Philly sports. Yeah. So for our listeners out there understanding our friendship, one of the great bonds that Vic and I had on set was talking football. And of course, yeah. the second you walk into Vic's office, you see an Eagles banner. If you're me, you're like, okay, great. A stranger that I'm probably going to work with multiple times. And now I know he likes football. Perfect. And if you remember, that's kind of how we initially bonded was sports talk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see my whole, uh, my whole throne here of, of, uh, everything <laughs> Philadelphia. You see that nice, um, that nice Super Bowl 52 helmet that's signed by everyone that the, the nice people of mind geek bought me before we wrapped up our relationship to you. That's prior. the greatest thing they gave you. That's amazing. Well done on their part. I'm impressed with that. Okay. We got yeah, well, that. Yeah, no, I mean, you have that. It just kind of shows you where we were in 2018, where they're calling me their friend and their frontline commander, and they buy me this very nice, expensive thing. And then two years later, we're not working together. Hmm. Very but it doesn't matter. Looking. After they bought you that thing, your team went to the Super Bowl. Sorry you didn't win last well, year. I really apologize yeah. about that. And I've really, I was, I was, I've been really cool, too. You notice I didn't troll you at all about the Phillies not making it to the World mm, Series. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we go far. Uh, we just can't seem to get it done since the uh, bizarro world of 2018 when all things that could happen or couldn't happen actually were happening, such as the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. I get yeah. it. Just like yeah. everybody's going to go out and get this right here. Filthy. You're going to mm -hmm. find this and your, your website is VicLagina.com. VicLagina.com. Yeah, VicLagina.com yes. will be everything. You'll get your audio. You can get the mm -hmm. audible book. There's a link to order, but you want to get this book. I promise you it will change your life. And again, there's a, a bit triggering for me. <laughs> yeah, and don't forget, there's a, there's a uh, a nice uh, trailer on the a book trailer on there featuring James Zuval, who who plays me. That was fun to shoot, and yeah, I guess really at the end of the day, I'm really proud of it because when I decided to do this, it was like it, this thing cannot look self published. It has to look like as good and as 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 awesome as possible, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to people people to feel they were holding like art in their hands that they could look through and appreciate, and that's what I hope to accomplish, and I, I felt I did. So you most certainly did. Thanks so much, everybody. Don't forget, go to viclagina.com and check out Filthy. You're going to want to read this, listen to it, watch the trailer. And Vic, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. It was always great talking to you. Let's go, Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> that was a conversation I knew you had to hear. Get your hands on this copy. I know for some of you that are listening, you can't see it, but you're going to be able to watch Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. Get your hands on Filthy. Download that audiobook and fall into this escape of what it was like to be behind the camera, to be managing a set, and all of the stories that only Vic could tell because his perspective was so different than mine as talent being on set, than even mine as being a producer because I was my own boss. Vic was working for someone else. You're going to love this book. It's the book that I think everybody has been waiting for about the business, but nobody really had the balls to put together. That's that book right there. Filthy. Check it out on Amazon. Look for the audio book. You can already get the Kindle version as well. And now it is time. But before we go to the mailbag, I want to remind you about the holiday season coming up and the fact that the best gift you can give someone is an experience. And better yet, if you can do the experience with your friends, family, your loved ones. But how about a tickets to a show, a concert, Broadway, a game, basketball, baseball, whatever you want to do, check out Ticket Rev. You can follow on social media at Ticket Rev. Go to TicketRev.com to learn all about 
this new way to buy tickets. As a buyer, you're not paying fees, which is very helpful. We've all gone to check out after getting a couple of tickets. And we're like, wait a minute, did I get three? I thought I ordered only two. It's the fees. Everyone complains about the fees. Well, that's not going to be your complaint when you start working with Ticket Rev. Download the Ticket Rev app and find out what is going on near you. Book an experience this year that you can do with your people in person and take some photos and remember forever. Go to TicketRev.com and learn more. Now the moment you've been waiting for. The mailbag is here. If you want to be a part of the mailbag, go to AskLisaAnn at gmail.com. Here we are for the mailbag portion of the Lisa Ann experience. I appreciate all of your emails. So if you've got something you want to ask, send it to asklisaann at gmail.com. Our first question comes in with the subject matter, first non-sports question. Hi, Lisa Ann. Hope all is well. I would ask, like to ask the following question in the hopes of ending this often hotly contested topic. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? I mean, I think it is because we've made it a Christmas movie and because it happens to be timed around Christmas in the actual movie. And I think like there's so many movies. The other night I watched Bad Mom's Christmas because it was on while I was laying down for my little nap in between events. And I was like, oh, it's about that time of the year where all of our favorite Christmas movies are up. It doesn't have to have Christmas in the title to be a Christmas movie. David, I hope I settled this debate. I hope I didn't go against the grain here. But I would say that, yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Next question right here. Dear Lisa Ann, congratulations on your own wine. My husband and I cannot wait to try it. We're wondering, where can we purchase the wine? Keep being you. Love, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. So as of right now, the wine is only available in New York for this first run. 2024, I'll be opening up four or five different states. It is already available for you to go and buy a bottle or buy it by the glass at Sapphire locations in New York City. You can go to Sapphire in Times Square. You can go to Sapphire 39th Street. or You can go to Sapphire 60th. And if you know this, every Thursday night, except for this Thursday, because I will be in Australia, Every Thursday night, I am at Sapphire 39 watching Thursday night football. So you not only can come in and try the wine, you can try it with me and I can talk to you about what I learned about the winery and the region in Sicily and the uniqueness of the grapes. So that's my answer for you for now, Hannah. And I'll be letting you know as soon as it starts landing in other places. The wine is called Lisa by Lisa Ann and the Instagram is at Lisa by Lisa Ann. More news coming soon. Last but not least, we got one from Grant from England. It says, greeting Lisa Ann. I appreciate that out of all the emails you receive, you picked mine to read. Thank you so much for that. And as an aspiring screenwriter with a published book on Amazon, the English language language and all of its idiosyncrasies motivate me every day to keep writing. Your passion for punctuation, grammar, and the thirst for knowledge through reading encapsulates my inspiration. It's a fever that I'm happy to decline medication for. I'm sure you would agree. With that said, I would love to hear your top five books that you would recommend for a fellow literacy enthusiast. No rules on genre, fiction, nonfiction, autobiography, just your five favorite books of all times that you would forever praise and spread the word. I would also love to share with you my top five favorite books in return, but I would I was raised as a gentleman, so ladies first. Grant, you must send me your five so I can do a continuation of this question. That is so great that you didn't give me your five because I get to answer you first. So I'm going to go way back, and I'm going to start with The Secret because I think The Secret is a read that is just a book that you can go back and reread and reread. And sometimes at times in life when our energy dips or our mojo dips, so we feel like we have a little less moxie, sometimes going back to something that made you feel so good and so inspired is like the perfect remedy. That is the secret for me. There's another book by Mitch Album. I think it's Album, as you pronounce his name. It's called The Seven People You Meet in Heaven. And it talks about seven people in your life that had such a difference 
that their impact was lifelong, right? And it, it could be a passing through of your life, but it was an impactful meeting. Those seven people you'll meet in heaven. From that, I will have to go over to some really good thinking books, right? Uh, the Minimalist. I mean, minimalism changed my life and it changed my life for the better. And if it wasn't for watching the Minimalist documentary on Netflix, I would have never ordered both of the books and then been gifted from the Minimalists themselves their latest book. So the first book on that is going to be Minimalism. And then their latest book, Love People, Use Things. The opposite never works. So, so far we have the secret. We have seven people you meet in heaven. We have minimalism and we have love people use things. Then I'm going to go back to a very basic book that I love. First things first. It is a great reminder. And I reread it my last trip going to Australia. And the reason I reread it was because I was planning on writing my second book and I want to remember how you prioritize your day to handle the things that get away from you that might not seem like a priority right now because they're not maybe earning you an income at that instant. They're not that instant gratification of everything else you're doing chugging along in your day. And that prioritization, that remembering first things first really helped me sit down with pen and paper and say, I'm going to put two hours a day, five days a week into this. Even if I'm not motivated to write, I'll just go back and read and re-edit. But so those are my list. And Grant, I cannot wait for you to send me yours. For all of you out there, I am holding up the book Filthy that you can order on Amazon. And I would like to thank my friend, Vic Legina, for coming on and sharing this wild story. I am almost through the book. It's taking me a little bit longer than it will take you because I have such a personal connection with so many of these stories. Vic also did thank me in the very open of his book. Uh, which I did not know he was doing. So thank you, Vic, for doing that. Personally flattered, glad to have you as a friend. I knew that we would be lifelong friends. And that's what I wrote when I did a little blurb about Vic, that he was really the calm in a sea of chaos that I knew I was going to walk hand in hand through life, laughing and learning together. And that's exactly what we're doing. I'd like to thank my sponsor, Ticket Rev. Go to at Ticket Rev on all social media, TicketRev.com to learn more, or just download that app and get your holiday gift giving going. I never remember to thank Kay, but thank you, Kay. I know you'll see this uh, because you are going to be editing this in, in no time, but Kay, you are one of those seven people I meet in heaven, so you know. And for everyone, Thursday night will not be this week, but every Thursday night for the rest of the football season, I will be at Sapphire 39. You can get Lisa by Lisa Ann at all three Sapphire locations. And this weekend, I am off to Melbourne, Australia for a quick 72-hour trip to join everyone there at Sexpo Love X. Check out my books, The Life and The Life Back. On my store, shoplisaand.com, where I can ship them to you personally autographed. If you're out of the U.S., you can get them autographed through fansutopia.com. Or you can just go on Amazon. My audiobooks are available for both books as well. So check them out. And except this week, I must keep saying this because I'm going to Australia. Uh, but every Wednesday night, you can catch me on Lisa Ann Does Fantasy Better. We stream live on YouTube on the Better Network as well as Fantasy Alarm, and you'll get to see this episode on my YouTube channel at 8 p.m. this Friday night. Thank you so much for being here with me through another episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. 